Well, it's my particular pleasure today to be talking to the art historian Nigel McGilchrist, my brother, about a new book that he's published called When the Dog Speaks, the Philosopher Listens. And it's about Pythagoras and how he fits into what he calls the curious age in which he lived. So thank you very much, Nigel, for agreeing to um, talk with me about this. I found it fascinating. I mean, I read it twice um, and I got more from it the, the second time. And it's a lovely book, if I may say so. It's um, sumptuously illustrated and, and also very wittily illustrated. I think, you know, one takes pleasure in both the illustrations and in the choice of them that you've made. Um, mm -hmm. And so that enhances the experience, which is a, a very um, appropriately harmonious one. Um, so perhaps we should begin talking about what you're talking about, really, which is, I think you would see this book as a work of the history of philosophy uh, in that genre. And, and one of the things you begin by outlining, and for me, I have heard you talk about it before, but I think it's fascinating and I'd like to hear again, is about the, the way in which the geographical situation of Greece and its landscape, not to say its light, um, go to compose a certain kind of civilization completely different from other great civilizations such as the Babylonian and the Egyptian. So perhaps you could talk a little about how you see those things affecting the way in which Greece developed and its thinking. Indeed, yeah, and it's, it's about a whole geography. It's a geography on, on different levels. It's, um, it's both a, a physical geography and, as you just mentioned, also a question of quality of light. Um, and it does naturally lend itself to comparison with the geographies of the other great earlier civilizations uh, of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, namely Babylon and Egypt. And Greece and Babylon and Egypt are all water-based civilizations in as much as Mesopotamia and Egypt obviously are based upon great rivers and Greece on the sea. But that is a fundamental difference because the sea, particularly the Aegean Sea, is a very unpredictable body of water. And the geography of what we understand as the ancient Greek world, you know, we have to make an adjustment here because we tend to see the Greek world nowadays when we sort of look at an atlas as that sort of peninsula coming down from the the Balkans, whereas in fact, it's the sea itself scattered with islands and the shores around it. So it's like an area which is a collection of uh, islands, of ports, of stepping stones. And that in itself brings us to the other, the actual position, the sort of physical position of Greece as a passageway, a stepping series. These islands literally are like stepping stones between Asia on the eastern side and Europe on the west, and also a north-south um, passageway between the Black Sea, which is very important as it penetrates deep into Asia, uh, uh, certainly in terms of trade, connecting that sea there and all that it uh, forwards to, um, to the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean and Egypt. And so it's a, it's a sea that's very much a crossroads. And it's a world that, as I say, is, is, is very unpredictable and fragmented by comparison, we say, not in obvious comparison, is that with, with Egypt, in which yes. the natural phenomena though they varied obviously much to the consternation at times of the Egyptians, had an extraordinarily recurrent uh, stability to them. The yeah. inundation of the Nile, which, on which their whole life depended, and the flowing of the river in the middle of an otherwise completely arid desert, and the rising and the setting of the sun in the, within a much narrower band, everything, both astronomical and physical, was much, much more regular. Uh, the Greek world was much more fragmented. It had uh, very, very different centers. It was very difficult to unify. And this is a really important point. Is, is that related perhaps to the idea of, 
um, not one central authority, but different mm. centers of, you know, in Isaiah Berlin's tendencies, it's contributing more to becoming a fox than becoming a hedgehog. <laughs> absolutely. No, no, very much a fox. Well, um, uh, uh, absolutely, different centres. I mean, it brings one in mind of, of what happened in Italy during the Renaissance. Lots of competing centres, Florence, Venice, Rome, Gorsi, yes. the bean markets, would be places like that. Uh, in the plain of Lombardy, all these islands competing with one another, very difficult physically for somebody. I mean, two great Persian emperors tried to invade Greece, both of them uh, failed, Xerxes and Darius. Um, it was never a country that was, uh, were, 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 was unified, as of course, Egypt, though um, one can't say that the whole of history of Egypt is one of unification. At times it split between North and, and repeatedly on several occasions between North and South, between Upper and Lower Egypt. But basically the river made it a very, uh, a very unifiable thing for an army that was swift to be able to move up and down. And it, its unity and its monumentality and its regularity and its predictability were fundamental parts of the psyche of Egypt, whereas the psyche of the Greek world is one unpredictability, yeah. a fragment of connectivity between broken things. Well, of course, you could imagine that I would particularly respond <laughs> to the idea of the the, the whole that is, um, you know, connected, connecting the parts, you know, which have their independence, but together create something new and coherent. And I think you point to another difference, which is that in the other great civilizations that uh, we've mentioned, there was a coherent body of belief, a set of received texts mm -hmm. and so forth, and that this didn't exist in the case of Greece. It's an unusual thing about Greece, yes. I mean, they were surrounded by civilizations which they admired profoundly. I mean, one only needs to open book three of, of Herodotus's histories to understand how deeply uh, an intelligent Greek admired everything Egyptian and they admired the Mesopotamians that they came into contact with. I mean, they, uh, they were surrounded by civilizations, Israelites, Babylonians, Egyptians, Hittites that had uh, the Persians, of course, that had sacred texts. And this was really important. They had, they had some body of literature at the heart of their um, their cultural world that gave them the answers to things and presented a picture of the universe as it should get, told them told them how they should be and how they were in relation to the divine. The Greeks didn't have this. The only overarching body of literature they had, which was familiar to them all, and runs right through their history, of course, is Homer. But Homer is full of <laughs> full of uncertainty in the way. I mean the when you begin the Iliad, you don't really know how it's all going to end. The battle is a very long and uncertain thing. But Odysseus's journeys, you never know where he's going to end up. It's all about unpredictability. There is nothing stable there at all. And this meant that the Greeks themselves had to work intellectually, do a lot of spade work in order to understand and to, to, to come to some agreement about where they came from, what the world, how the world worked, what the principles of ethics were, and uh, you know these had to be worked out by them. There was no revel no revelatory body of literature, no books, pyramid texts, or books of the dead which told them what happened after no uh, after, after life was so, you know the relationship between life and the afterlife very very so, good. and what what comes to mind there is this feeling of exploring without preconceptions which is a very new idea yeah, yeah and exactly. that seems a very powerful one and i'd never really thought about it until you make the point that drama you know of course what we largely associate with apart from homo is is with the greek um literature is 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 its drama and you point out that drama is a kind of living workshop in which things are being you know experientially um explored in a way that has no particular per, um uh axe to grind but is actually trying to approach some kind of a human truth yes it's it, exactly it's an existential workshop in yeah. um 
great uh, issues you know, of what it means to be cursed, what the problems are about love and hate and within a family, um, all these things, I mean, really important moral and ethical issues. Yes, yes. Were developed and worked out on a stage before the eyes of a whole gathered community because you know drama was something that involves the whole community and in these magnificent settings they sat and watched them often for hours and for days on end mm. and they were aware that when they watched them of course you know the nature of their their communities and their city states was such that they could be called to the same theater again in so many days mm. um, to meet not to watch a drama but to participate in a real human drama, in other words, a decision about going to war or whether yeah. somebody should be put to death or whatever, and they would have to think about that and vote and hear the arguments about it. And that. So yes, it made all Greeks participants. It made them uh, in the business of philosophy. So, you know, in, in, in a humble way, they had to participate in it. Made them all philosophers in a way. Uh, there was no, sort of top-down receiving exactly. from, a, from a sacred text. So to go back to your second question, it's simply that, yes, absolutely. Yes, well, it, it um, I mean, once you illuminate these points, they seem obvious, but it hadn't really occurred to me how much of our own way of thinking since the Renaissance owes to the Greeks. I mean, I, I, of course, I've learned that, I, I, I've ingested that and mm. so on. And we know that in various obvious ways, the Renaissance was a return to Greek and Roman um, history and values. But there's, you know, what you bring out is quite how new this way of being and thinking in the world was, really. It was at that time, yes. And you also connect it with the East, don't you? I mean, we've talked a bit about Babylon and Egypt, but here I think we're talking more about what? India, possibly even China. Well, I think, I think China is a, is a step too far. I mean, we've given what we know today about communications and trade, because of course the spread of ideas is, is very much predicated on, on trade and um, I think for the moment we just have to think of China as perhaps a step too far, but India right up until the end of the Roman Empire was in constant contact with the uh, Eastern Mediterranean world through trade um, and particularly in the, in, the, in the Greek world beginning with the time of Pythagoras and then going on uh, very much through the Hellenistic period and into Roman times. So yes, it, it's a very important connection and we tend to think you know, I mean, this is one of the, I think, the repeating um, points about the book is that um, we need to unlearn so many things about our own, you know, way of thinking, which we just take for granted. I mean, we take for granted that uh, the sea is a sort of barrier and that the land is where you communicate with. It's quite the opposite with the Greek world and the ancient world. It's much more about sea connecting and land dividing people. Um, we tend to think of the East and the West as being very, very separate and very um, divided from one another because today for reasons of religious blocks, because we have Islam there and Christianity here, we tend to think of them as, as very divided. And in thinking about the ancient world, you have to remember that these divides didn't exist. It was a much more fluid world. It was therefore much easier for ideas uh, to spread uh, in a world before the great faiths had, um, had in a way changed the intellectual geography of the world. And we still think with the, in the terms that the, those great faiths have taught us to think in terms of. Exactly. So, I said exactly. Mm. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, judgment and logic and, you know, of coming to truth through argument and through and thinking of our term, uh, existence in terms of um, a, 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 a single God above us, not, not our being part of the divine or the divine being all around us on a different level. I mean, there's a much, you know, there are many divides that seem to me to have come not just geographical, but actually spiritual and and uh, psych psychological that uh, have, have, and we just need to un unlearn them. And the wonderful thing about looking at 
Pythagoras, and I mean, as you do in your book, the, the pre-Socratics, is that this helps you to, 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 to enter a world in which the great, the great faiths hadn't conditioned our way of thinking in yes. those days, and, that, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it, it's helpful for us. It helps us also see, you know, the good and the bad that they have brought for us. And, and one could say, not just the great faiths, but the advent of Plato and Aristotle, really, that changed yeah. the way uh -huh. in which we think about thinking. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. And, and I think, you know, this leads very nicely to Pythagoras, because you talk about his being willing to explore and borrow from Eastern thinking. Um, and you make the point, which I think is, is an interesting one, perhaps you could expand on it, that it was not just a kind of give and take between East and West with their thinking, but that the, the West took certain things that were almost lying there in plain sight in the Eastern world of thought and made something different of them. Could you, could you talk a bit more about that and explain what you mean? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's a, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's a very important point because the Greeks in this way in Pythagoras is a transformative influence. They take, as you say, things that were lying there in, 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 in a sort of plain sight, but had been the potential, the universal potential of those observations had not been uh, understood until the time of Pythagoras. I mean, we associate, if, if you go out into the street and you ask people, you know, what do you know about Pythagoras? They'll mention something about the, the hypotenuse and the right angle triangle and what they remember from school. Anybody who's had anything to do with music will talk about the harmonics. And um, they, they'll forget that also Pythagoras is very, very interested in all kinds of matters of the, of the soul and transmigration as well, but that's not, Important that those two things, the, the harmonics of music, in other words, the understanding how uh, intervals, musical intervals, which build up harmonies for us, come from exact arithmetical proportions of yes. mood lengths. We would know now, but I mean, as he saw it in terms of the length of a piece of string being uh, twice yes. a certain tone. That and the knowledge of the right angle triangle, three, four, five, for example, the commonest one of all. Uh, which lies behind the, uh, the, the, the theorem. These we know from very good scholarship, people like uh, Otto Neugebauer, um, were known in Babylon probably a thousand years before uh, Pythagoras lived. Uh, the, the Babylonians were incredible calculators and observers, wonderful, as were the Chinese, as were the Indians. I mean, long before Greece, it, because Greece comes onto the situation very late because of a strange meltdown that had happened in the Aegean world around, around the end of the, the, the Neolithic period, around the sort of middle of the second millennium BC or the end of the second millennium BC. So it's really picking itself up at that time, whereas these other civilizations have had a continual um, life of intellectual activity. And so they're in many ways, they have a greater tradition in observation and calculation, extraordinary calculations the, the Babylonians can do, but they, they did it without understanding somehow the universal significance of what they were calculating. And it took a mind like Pythagoras to see that it wasn't just an arid question of, uh, of, of arithmetical relationships in music, but it's the fact that beneath something which is beautiful, the sound of harmony, is a mathematical structure. Mm. And if it was true about music, might it not be true also about the movements of the stars, which seem to have a regularity about them? Might it not be true about, I mean, if only we could look and understand, it might be true of all aspects or many aspects of the beauty in our world. So he, he takes these ideas and makes them, um, sees their universal potential. And the same with the theorem. It, it, it's not just a, an arid calculation about triangles. It, 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 once Pythagoras has shown us that there are such things as universal law in the natural physical world, then on those you can build science. Without that, 
that presupposition and that predication, you can't have science. So in a way, he, he literally ushers us into the scientific world. He says, did dinner is an example of a universal or something that is true universally. And from this, we can build you know, our, our world of science, what we call science and physics is predicated on that assumption about universal law. And I, I, I imagine there will be people who would say, but science also had origins in India and possibly in Egypt that, um, you know, that their observations of the stars, their ability to measure and compare and so on were, were important steps in the history of science. Hugely important. Yeah. Hugely. But, the, but, but again, they didn't see the, the, the wider implication of what they were looking at. I see, yes. They, they, didn't, they, they, they weren't able sufficiently to put back, pull back and see the other applications of what they were studying. I mean, they, yes, they... So, so I mean, in, in, in this sort of... When, there isn't a prize giving here, but in this metaphorical prize giving, there are no prizes for, to Pythagoras for having discovered the yes. right angle triangle, all the harmonics and music, or any of those things, even though that's a commonplace of Western thinking that he was. You know, we, we, yes. you know. So, uh, in a way, the book is trying to correct our misassumptions about Pythagoras. Yes, yes. But he wasn't great in those ways. He was great, on the other hand, in a very different way in that he took these simple things which were there. Yes. Um, so in a way, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was just going to, to, <laughs> to, to say you've raised a, a question which uh, I think is an important one that's bound to occur to any reader. Why Pythagoras? I mean, he, he's somebody that you yourself point out we know rather little about. Mm -hmm. And you list the, the few things that we do know about him. And then you say was going to be a chapter on each of these, and I, I found that an exciting idea when I when I read it. But I, I'm, I'm sure that you know it, it's a good question. Why did you choose Pythagoras, since we know so little about him? Yes, I, um, I suppose. Okay, we come to the thorny question. You're right, we know very little about, about I mean, a biographical detail about Pythagoras. I mean, he never wrote anything as far as we know. There's some commentators and later historians say he did write things. Um, so, you know, how can one possibly write a book uh, about someone uh, who one knows so little about? What does seem to be clear is that he traveled, that he was, he came from a, a trading uh, background, uh, family background. Uh, the island that he grew up on, the island of Samos, was probably the most actively involved in international trades, particularly with Egypt. So here is a mind that is in that mercantile world that is moving, that he went to Egypt. I mean, it seems fairly clear he went on a number of occasions to Egypt. And there are these uh, sayings that he went further east to Babylon. In the end, it doesn't really matter whether he went to Babylon actually in person or by foot, or whether ideas from Mesopotamia came to him. And it's probably unlikely that it's possible that he went to India, but it's unlikely that, that, mm -hmm. that he did. But that doesn't stop thinking coming out of uh, India through Mesopotamia. Even he could even have stayed in Samos all his life because that's actually those ideas were coming through the Persian Empire right to the coast uh, of uh, the Aegean. So the, it, he was a traveler either in reality but certainly in mind. Mm. And because he is so open to Eastern ideas and so curious about them, and he gets a lambasting from Heraclitus for being so uh, um, curious about them. I mean, Heraclitus views this, um, I mean, Heraclitus was a difficult old grouch. I mean, he, he didn't have a nice word to say about anybody, but he, he criticizes uh, Pythagoras, I think, in essence, for being too much enthralled to what he heard from the East. Mm. Um, but that's Okay, like it or not, Heraclitus, that, that, that's what we are actually at the moment are going to cherish Pythagoras for, because he is like a pondery from yes. you know, east to west. But this is a fair point to, to say, certainly to my thinking, when 
I first encountered both Heraclitus and Taoism in my late teens, mm. but they seemed to have quite a lot in common with one another and much, each of them, not much to do with the post-Platonic philosophical tradition. Mm. So is it possible that these ideas percolated more widely in Greece and Heraclitus picked them up that way? Or, or what would you say about that? The, that Heraclitus actually is picking up something from the Orient. From, from Taoism. Yes, I mean, I don't think it, it, it's possible to come from China. I think that's, that's okay. not possible. But China obviously is also listening to India. Absolutely. I mean, there are all kinds of sort of connections there. And obviously the flow of Buddhism very yes. early on into China means that, okay, Heraclitus is hearing also maybe you know, what, what, um, what, what the Chinese are also hearing. But I do feel that Heraclitus is a very, very different kind of soul from Pythagoras. I mean, he's a real loner. Yes. A really, I mean, a person who looks in on himself and produces from a kind of deep poetical impulse these ideas. I, I like to think of him as the sort of William Blake of the ancient uh, philosophical world, somebody who is just completely irreducibly original and, and not in touch with the others. Pythagoras is much more like a a Wordsworth or Coleridge that is sort of in a, you know, in, a, in an interconnected world. Heraclitus, and not at all. And I feel that his great apostles are, are simply, are, are simply from his, deep within his own thinking, which is quite different from Pythagoras. And we're not playing a, um, a better or worse game in this at all. I mean, Heraclitus is none the lesser thinker than Pythagoras. It's just that the mechanisms are different. I, no, I take that for granted, and I'm I'm not supposing that you. They're both to, very, very great in different ways. Uh, you can say, well, of course, Heraclitus is a more original man than 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 Pythagoras. Fair enough. The only thing I feel about Pythagoras, it's very special about him that it distinguishes him from from Heraclitus and all the others at the time, is that he doesn't just say the world is like or the universe is like this, the cosmos is like this. Uh, Heraclitus tells us, you know, I mean, by his extraordinary sort of lightning apostles about sort of the nature of, of, of things and the universe and processes. Yes. Pythagoras try aspires towards uh, showing us how to live, how to live better, how we should be. And, and th I mean, this brings in a part of which we haven't discussed of him, you know, he's He's, he's tuning into what the Vedic literature is saying about the transmigration of the soul. And we do know he was very interested in that because the only anecdote we have from his lifetime mm. told by one of his contemporaries, Xenophanes of Colophon, uh, relates to this particular fact. It just is the, it's, it's the anecdote which gives rise to the title of the book. Uh, Pythagoras is walking through the marketplace. Uh, a man was beating a dog, he said, stop beating the dog <clears throat> because I recognize in the yelping of the dog the voice of a deceased friend of mine. Okay, well, it sounds, I mean, in Xenophanes, it seems to be telling it as a sort of kind of way of almost ridiculing the silliness of Pythagoras's way of thinking. But of course, it introduces the whole idea of what Pythagoras talking about, you know, the soul's pass from a deceased friend into a dog. So in, in that sense, Pythagoras opens out much more than many of the other uh, pre-Socratic philosophers uh, towards a way in which we need to live, uh, because transmigration of souls reflects upon us morally and ethically how, how, if we, how we behave now comes back to haunt us, or we have to learn again how to do things better, whatever. So, he, he, Yes, he's no less, uh, and in many ways, perhaps less original than uh, Heraclitus, but much more, a much wider vision, I feel. Yes, I mean, and that's something, the transmigration of souls, it would be good to um, touch on again a little later. But, but I was thinking that, I mean, maybe one way of putting it is that Pythagoras, from what we know of him, was a more likable, uh, more sympathetic sort of person than Heraclitus. I mean, Heraclitus, as you say, um, was was scornful and, and grumpy. 
Um, and, and maybe that, you know, and I'm not saying that it's just a matter of personality, but that leads to a certain kind of philosophy. And what you point out, and perhaps we should talk about those things, is, you know, the, the contributions in language that Pythagoras made for us. Mm. They're really important, really. I mean, these are fundamental. And in fact, the first of the, the six chapters that you alluded to, to the things that, I mean, I, the, the problem is a, a religion, if you like, grew up around Pythagoras after his death. So much was said about what he had said or thought of what he said. In the end, there's such a barrage of contrasting information about where he was, what he said, what he did, yeah. that in the end you have to say, look, you know, what can we really actually say Pythagoras may have said? And I, you, I like you, you, you use a lovely, lovely expression, you know, that the, the signal from Pythagoras comes and goes, but unfortunately, <laughs> Very, very close on the on the bandwidth. There is radio Pythagoreanism, and it's much louder and more certain of itself. <laughs> yes, it was just a way of saying that's what we hear. What has been made of Pythagoras by others yeah. from yeah. what you can glean, and I think you you make a very uh, uh, um, the best ever in my experience attempt to to reconstitute something about what Pythagoras really stood for and it's obfuscated by some of the ideas people have coming from it one thing i, I wanted to say uh, is you make a very good point I, I think i've got the point i hope i have if i haven't correct me but um even when it comes to things like um the 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 one thing we all do know which is the pythagorean uh, square on the hypotenuse that you point out that and i think this is a good insight that whereas the Egyptians and Babylonians are very good at measurement arithmetic lines that he brought in the concept of area of space more into his mathematics and you could say that in music again one is seeing the connections between points and places that create in another modality something like the space and I, I thought that was lovely, and, and perhaps you would like to just comment on that before we go on. Yes, no, I mean, it, uh, that's true. It's as if the Greeks, I mean, it's not just Pythagoras, but the Greek mind itself kind of notches things up into a, a higher dimension. Exactly. We suddenly go from thinking about life or about simple arithmetic relationships to the, the nature of their connection in the form of harmony or in the form of geometry, which is a, you know, two or three dimensional uh, study of number. And the Greeks naturally thought in terms of, 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 of geometry, they were natural geometers in the way that, um, I mean, this sounds like a terrible, uh, uh, generalization, but the, 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 as you said, the Egyptians and Babylonians were brilliant calculators and arithmeticians, but not by nature, not uh, willing geometers. And that is a, a, a very important thing because the, 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 the theorem of Pythagoras, I mean, it's worth noting this isn't, doesn't say that a and B and C, the three measurements of the right and the sides of the triangle, of the right angle triangle, are relatable in any way that can be defined by mathematics. But the areas on each one can be. Yes. A, there is no relationship, universal law between A, B, and C, but except through A squared, B squared, and C squared. So you are pulled by the mathematics out into the wider, into another dimension. And, and, and so, yes, it's a very important thing. And the, the Greeks were able to do this in every way. It's part of what I mean about their being able to, um, to, to see a more universal side of things, which are, they have been so brilliantly observed at a, on a, on a, at a lower level, or at a lower level of dimension in, by the Babylonians, the Indians, the Persians, the Egyptians. Mm. Yeah. Egyptians have been measuring their their land uh, or using the three, four, five triangle. Um, yes, for for millennia, for millennia, they had to do it because the Nile flooded, and every time the Nile went down, the boundaries of, of property for fiscal reasons had to be re-established, and they used that. And, 
uh, shut it down. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I hope we can come back to language later on because I never got. No, well, we can go there right away. I, I just wanted to comment that um, even as you were talking, it makes me think differently about the importance of square square numbers or in algebra, you know. MC squared. Yeah, well, yeah, it seemed yeah. to me odd. Why squared? You know, why? And uh, the question is open. But one little light bulb is that this has something to do with multidimensionality. Uh, anyway, there we are. I, I... Absolutely. So. And, and harmony in music is a multidimensionality of these very simple intervals. Yes. That the Babylonians observe. Yes. Pythagoras saw the connection between something abstract, beauty that we appreciate and enjoy and that moves us from, from harmony and the, from the, pre, the, the hearing of harmony and the, the, the awareness of harmony from, from these arithmetical proportions. Yeah. So, so, yes, I think to talk a little bit more about harmonia um, and its meaning for Pythagoras and in that age um, would be very useful. Mm. Yes, uh, I mean, generally said that Pythagoras is responsible for three new words into our vocabulary, and one of which is harmonia. And harmozo in ancient Greek means to uh, to join, to join together, to to and a harmonia is actually referred to in uh, in the Odyssey, describing mm. the joints, the the carpentry, the woodwork joints that uh, um, Odysseus makes so well in the boat that he's building when he leaves the island of Calypso. So uh, Pythagoras takes this idea of a, a, of, a piece of carpentry, of the perfect fitting of things together, how when they're perfectly in the right relationship, they become useful and beautiful. Uh, and he introduces this, uh, the, the word of harmony and takes it and applies it also to to, to music where it has remained ever since. But the most interesting of the, the words, the three, cosmos, harmonia, and philosophia, is cosmos, uh, because it has a double meaning in Greek. Uh, in Greek. And Pythagoras is the person who gives, I mean, we talk about cosmos today and cosmology, thanks to Pythagoras's understanding of or use of that word. Because cosmos in Greek, in Homeric Greek, which is as early as we can go in, 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 in the Greek language, um, you know, without going into things like Mycenae, where we don't have any sort of enough literature to understand the origins further back of these words. Um, cosmos means two things. It means in, in Homer, it means order. It means the relationship of one thing to another, the way the order in which sailors sit in a boat or um, soldiers are arranged in an army, the simple sort of schematization of things. But it's also the root of our word cosmetics, uh, and the, it has this meaning of things that make us more beautiful. That cosmos was the 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 the, the elements that made a woman beautiful, that enhanced her eyebrows, or um, because any cosmetic touches. So the one and the same word implies what makes for beauty, with what makes for scheme and organization and relationship, and. His, his thinking is based on this idea, yeah. same with the music, that the order uh, scheme of, of arithmetical scheme becomes uh, harmony. So it's an important thing. Yes, and um, I was thinking that the, the words, the various words that have been used in different contexts to, to mean whatever it is that is the generative divine or sacred origin of things, uh, li in Chinese, rta in Sanskrit, the logos when it when it meant what it originally meant, not what it has come since to me, oh, yeah. suggested a, a, a an order which was fitting as well as beautiful, and that's an interesting idea that, because, as you say, this idea of um, harmonia comes essentially from carpentry, two surfaces that fit, or as we say in English, marry. Mary, um, yeah. And it's rather lovely, this idea of things coming together in a way that is fitting. But it, it's a point that 
I find very difficult. Maybe you can help me with this, because what what exactly do we mean by fitting that is not, um, as it were, recursive to its own origin? Well, it's fitting because that's what fits. I mean, how do you how does one discover what it is that is fitting? Would Pythagoras have had an answer to that? Well, I mean. It- in, in, in as much as he explains it through sound and music, yes, the the, the yeah. fittingness goes back to because I mean, all, all he's saying really is that music is audible geometry. Mm. It, it, it's geometry. It's music. It's number. It's integral numbers in relation to one another made audible. Mm. I mean, he didn't understand the step we now know that there are sound waves, which you know, I mean, we know about the physics of sound. He had no idea about. But he could see that even though there was something missing between them, the music or the harmony was much simpler in his day than, a, you know, whatever a great piece of music today was a, a, was sound, um, was the geometry, the harmony was the geom- sound, the geometry made audible. And what, what, what that might sound to somebody who hasn't read your work is that um what i think what you're not suggesting is that music just is those um no. skeleton, the mathematical skeleton what you are a pains to emphasize and which as you can imagine is also very resonant for me is the idea of the way in which he manages to unify synthesize bring together things that we have learnt to think of or perhaps the Western tradition has taught us to think of as opposed to one another. And one of them is the way in which this abstraction is also one with the beauty of a form. So that you talk about the mathematics of a statue, or of, a, of a kouros, uh, whatever it may be, but that in, in Pythagoras's teaching, in his philosophy, in his way of looking at the world, this otherwise rather abstract matter has a kind of earthy beauty as well absolutely yeah and, and your mention of the the sculpture is very important because it was fundamentally very schematized in the ancient world they'd learned that from greeks had learned that from the egyptians and uh, but on the other hand that is what gives it its beauty mm. the, 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 not just the symmetry but the play itself on another level between asymmetry and symmetry, because yeah. the beauty of Greek sets of statues is, yes, okay, apparently they seem symmetrical, but when you start to look at them, the asymmetry is what, what gives them the slight beauty. And, and, and just on the subject of those, you know, the, the, the Lee and the other words talking about, uh, that you mentioned a, a moment ago, I, I, just recently I've been reading quite a lot uh, about ancient Egypt for an entirely another reason, but the Egyptian idea of Maat, Maat, uh, M-A-A-T, which was the perfect ordering and operation of things when the Nile inundated to the right degree at the right moment and, you know, the Pharaoh's responsibility to keep everything in nice relationship, which they called Maat, I suddenly I began to think, well, of course, Pythagoras, the one place we know he really pretty surely did go was Egypt. And uh, evidently, you know, he, he had a letter from uh, Polycrates of Samos to, introducing him to the pharaoh. So he had sort of access to the high priests and all that. And they must have talked about this. And maybe this idea of Mark comes into cosmos. But anyway, so yeah. we won't leave the Egyptians out of that as well. I mean, you know, the Sanskrit and the Chinese is important, but also Egyptian Mark. There's already enough there, isn't there? Um, and in a way, what you were opening up is the notion that we don't really know that much about where Pythagoras definitely went, we can suppose, and there are hints and so forth. But uh, you make the good point that we're in the position of trying to reconstruct a world of thought and a world of feeling from one or two fragmentary expressions or images. And uh, you say, I, I think completely rightly, that although you know somebody would be awestruck on seeing Christ in the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, 
what would they know of Jesus of Nazareth from that image? And I think, you know, that's worth bearing in mind. Sorry? And what he had to say to it. What he had to say. So that, that this this reconstructive process you are juggling with, um, I think admirably well, but it is a difficult thing to do. Um, and, and it really comes back in a way to my question, sort of why did you choose this particular philosopher? And it may be just that the the appeal of these particular ideas, which seem so important in in the history of philosophy, are the word philosophy, the love of wisdom, beauty and harmony. And I've been corrected by uh, a number of philosophers when I've said to them, this doesn't seem to me to have very much to do with the root of the word philosophy. And they'd say, what is the root of the word philosophy? And I'd say the love of wisdom. And they'd say, it has nothing to do with that. So that's certainly <laughs> the aspiration of academic philosophers in the West now. Why does it have nothing to do with another wisdom? Well, you ask them, but that's the answer I receive. I think what they are saying is it has to do with a particular art that we learn in a faculty uh, when we study philosophy and we carry on promulgating it. And it's very much like, I would say, the other, you know, the thing comes back, you know, the difference between Pythagoras and his teaching and Pythagoreanism. <laughs> There's a difference between philosophy and the sort of philosophyism that we now have mm -hmm. um, since, since Plato and Aristotle. And you make the point that Pythagoras didn't particularly value words or the arguments that could be constructed out of words. He thought that the depth was poorly represented by words and by argument and much better represented by music and the experience of, of hearing it. And by geometry and mathematics, which is as a wonderful way of obviating words as well. Yes. 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 Yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, that particular idea about maths and beauty strung rung quite a few bells with me because um, when I was writing the matter with things, I, I, I gathered about, you know, a dozen uh, instances in which mathematicians or scientists said, I knew this had to be right because it was beautiful. And its beauty struck me very strongly. Uh, um, Einstein above all in those, but me others too. Yes, absolutely. Yes. 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 The only thing is, I don't know whether you can say that beauty is truth. I know that you, you do, I think, tend towards that view. I think there is, and I, th I think, as you say, that they share, in some circumstances, they share a very great deal, which I think is right. But can they be, can they be equated? <laughs> well, truth is beauty, beauty is truth is, is poetry, is a poetic phrase anyway, of, uh, yeah. pieces, which yeah. I use in the epilogue of the, uh, of, of the book. And of course, as a as a as a poetic phrase, it goes a stage. It, it jumps a stage, you know, which leaves the 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 writing, arguing philosopher behind. I mean, it it it, it jumps sure. to a conclusion which maybe it has no right uh, to make. All, all I'm concerned to to say in the book is that Pythagoras uh, pr prioritizes beauty. Yes. Uh, on that journey to truth more than any other thing. Beauty as it appeared to him through, through, through harmony, through mathematical and geometrical perfections, through harmony and music, through, uh, it, it's, yes, I mean, and, and yes, yes. Yeah. And, and of course he was, as, we can't say sort of truth is beauty, beauty is truth. No, I mean, though Keats says that, and as I say, that's where the poetry leaves us behind. Yeah. And we either accept it as a, a poetic insight or not. But uh, as I say, yes, I think sort of Pythagoras pri prioritizes it uh, in his search for what is, what is, and his recommendation to us of what is true. Yes, and I think it's worth um, remembering that, it, that amongst the various um, perceived contraries that he's able to synthesize are reason and beauty and uh, mm -hmm. science and philosophy. And so you're, you're constantly saying, again, something that naturally appeals to me, 
that he perceives the ways in which these things that we so often split up and study in independently as though they had nothing to do with one another that you know that body and soul that reason and and feeling and spiritual meaning are not fillable out in that way yes because he had the luxury that we don't have of living in the pre verbalization epoch which begins with plato and aristotle yeah. I mean, he, he had that luxury. What a lucky man. Would that we could all go back to that. And you know, in a way, the book is a kind of sort of wish that one day we can we can move back to that. We can, you know, after this huge parenthesis of the domination of verbalization, that we can go back to seeing things not through words, but through through number, through mathematics, through through intuition, through beauty, through yeah, music, whatever. Yeah. Is two two insights that um, you you give to the reader okay here. One is that Pythagoras apparently um, suggested to his disciples that they should spend the first five years in silence. I mean, whether or not it's true, I don't know. But <laughs> no, no, we'll never know. No, well, no, we'll never know, as you say. Uh, but the other is that. that and this seems very real that the Pythagoreans used music to heal. Yes, but both of these things are things which are, are mentioned by Jamblichus, who uh, writes about Pythagoras almost 800 years, seven, 800 years after Pythagoras is dead. So there's an awful lot of processing has gone on in the meantime. Yes. But I think in the case of the first, that the students had to be silent for the first five years. You know, I'm, I'm sure, Py well, I'm not sure, but I mean, I, I would suggest that Pythagoras probably didn't, you know, legalize it into five years or whatever, but the, the, the desire, the aspiration that to begin with, you should listen. And it's not just a question of, I mean, we immediately think, oh, teacher, pupil, teacher, pupil must shut up and listen to teacher. No, it's yeah. an exhortation to listen and be receptive. Exactly. And, uh, and this is how I think we should understand the word philosophia, to go back to your, your, your question, you know, your point about the origin of the word. It, 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 philosophia philosophia is, is a welcoming attitude towards knowledge and experience, because philoxenia is, uh, is a welcoming attitude towards the xenos, the person who comes from outside. Very mm. important thing. Mm. Philosophia, uh, an, op an openness and a receptivity. So receptivity is very important. It was important that to begin with, when you know, according to Jamblichus' description of the Pythag the teaching of the Pythagorean life, that the, the student should uh, listen and, and, and become be receptive in the first part of his or her training. Because we must remember this was as Jamblichus tells us, open to men and to women, unusually. I mean, you know, it was a, a not how we imagined the Greek world, which is, you know, later, which is very patriarchal. It was, and Pythagoras is very, seems to be, according to Jamblichus, very clear about this. It was entirely open to men and, and women in all structures of society, the schools. Um, so, uh, yes. Um, well, I, I, you know, I think your emphasis on receptivity is hugely important because of course once we get to the platonic uh, idea of philosophy it's very much a, it's a listening but it's also a speaking and a dialogue which is a, a wonderful way in which mm. to arrive at something but eventually it becomes more like the tracking down of something by a series of steps so that you've got it and you make the point that it's not really about acquisition it's about openness to whatever it may be which may be something if this process works well that can't actually be encapsulated in language so and, and you know my 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 <laughs> my belief that the right hemisphere is this openly receptive hemisphere that does that and, and it's not that it's unintelligent it's not that it can't understand language it's not that it it, it prefers music but but it certainly is the intelligent the more intelligent as it turns out hemisphere um so this process seems to me very beautifully exemplified in the case of of your account of pythagoras mm. well, I think, yes
when 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 i when you talk about um iamblichus it makes me uh, think about the the stories that other people may know about pythagoras and you do you do touch on them and i think you say they're probably unlikely um because was it not iamblichus who who and this is not one of the stories but who pointed out that there were about nine people called pythagoras around and the, uh, there's, there's actually diogenes laertius who said okay that. i know that one of them had four and somebody else added on five and so pythagoras was said to be in seen in italy and in greece at the same time so yeah, we so don't really know they're talking about the same person Yes, he interestingly names that at the time of Pythagoras there were four other people and he says what they were. One of them was a, uh, an anatomist, another was a, a physical athletics trainer and, and, and so forth. Yes. And then he goes on to say there were actually, actually five others. And, um, and also he mentions, I think it's he, not uh, Jan, because that, um, that Pythagoras was seen in two separate places at, at uh, one and the same time. So the, the it raises the possibility that you know, you know, maybe there was more than one Pythagoras. That it, 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 for me, it just helps to understand this disjunct between these wonderful ideas that he seems to have had early in his life and the travels, uh, you know, his fundamental ideas of harmony, the theorem, uh, questions of listening and receptivity, and all that. And this sort of plethora of what are called the accusmata, the things that were, were heard, the sort of sayings of Pythagoras, which come later and part of the Pythagoreanism, radio Pythagoreanism, as it were. Yes, um, yes. And, and they seem to me to be on such different levels that at times you feel, well, surely there must be somebody else involved. Well, Diogenes <laughs> suggests that maybe there could easily have been some confusion going on there because of that but you know we'll, we'll never be able much to get to the bottom well it's worth pointing out that if one considers there was at least one continuous story here that it began in greece and then moved to italy and and i think that's that's what i i think you're referring to when you contrast the earlier pythagoras with this later pythagoras yes because in italy the establishment of what are called the pythagorean schools which were for promulgating this kind of uh, um, yeah the, the accusmata and the, the rules of the life and how it should be but even those are all very you know was Pythagoras vegetarian? Mm. Um, I mean, given what he has to say about the transmigration of souls and the universal kinship of living things, it's very likely, very likely and possible that he was the first ethical vegetarian in the, the West. I mean, I say in the West because obviously this has a much older tradition in countries like India, um, as opposed to just being for diet dietetical reasons but um we don't know because certain writers say actually um he chose certain meats that could be eaten and others have not and then others say he you know i mean there, if every one thing you can say about writers, <laughs> later writers will tell you the, the, the opposite so it's very very difficult to to, to, to establish really and, and this brings me in mind of something that uh, really, I think only occurred to me after I finished writing the book that um, one, one of the, I mentioned earlier on, there are things that we have to unlearn when we come to the ancient world. And one of the things that I think we have to question, if not unlearn, is the way we have been taught by the great faiths in the West, the three great faiths of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, that mankind is has dominion over nature, that nature is the world is created and the animals and the plants are given to man for his use of fruct and, and pleasure or whatever, which is fundamental to all those. It's in the, it's in the uh, you know, the Quran and the Bible and the, the uh, book of Genesis. Um, and that this has led us to, a, to have a relationship with nature, which has given rise to the problems we have at the moment, we've lost that sense of communality with the natural world, that it is a community of which we are a part, not the dominating alien who sort of controls. Um, 
and the environmental problems that we face today, which are the most serious of all. I mean, we have many political, geopolitical, cultural problems, but there is nothing. They've always come and gone through the, the long stretch of history. The one that we are facing, which has never been faced before, is the collapse of our, uh, um, our own environment. And, you know, thinking of Pythagoras and his sense of the universal kinship of, of, of all living things puts us back into the right relationship with nature, which the great faiths have, have skewed us from, from I think, from, from seeing. Uh, and what about beans? Since that's one of the things people the beans, probably yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> what can we say about that? Should we, should we explain that beans were, were anathema to, I mean, the father bean, yeah. evidently, I mean, this is what uh, commentators on Pythagoras has spilt a lot of ink on in subsequent centuries. Pythagoras appears to have pro prohibited the consumption of father beans. Yeah. Even to the point that John Diogenes Laertius again says that um, he was seen fleeing from a battlefield in Sicily, but was killed because he refused to go through a field of beans. Uh, such was his antipathy to the poor, uh, you know, father being a beautiful plant with a very beautiful and valid product which we eat and enjoy. What does one make of this? I mean, did he suffer from favorism? You know, ter yes. a terrible allergic reaction to beans or, or, yes. or would he ironizing? I mean, this is partly, you know, one of the problems when, we, when, we, when we're so distant from someone, we, we have no knowledge of the context. I'm mean, thinking this in terms of what you say at the end of your own book, you know, when, when sayings are taken out of their context, when we can't see the context, they you know, how can we how can we get a grasp on this idea of what he's saying about beans if he ever did say anything about it? Yes, yes. Well, without we'll the context, context. Without the way in which it's said, you know, I mean, this is. Yes, yes. You know, if we had the sayings of Jesus in the way in which they said, the tone of voice, the context, the conversation that was happening, how much more would we understand about what he's telling us, it's all the same about the Prophet Muhammad or about the Buddha or whoever it is, or yeah. any, you know, it's... Of course. Yes, and you, 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 you liken it to the business of trying to think one's way back into what the art of a certain era was really like. Right, if, yeah. if you had to try and understand Leonardo's um, Mona Lisa by uh, studying a mosaic that was made a hundred years later <laughs> or, or two hundred oh. years later, you know, or whatever it is, and trying to reconstruct what the experience that painting was. Yes, and, and this is absolutely what we're left with, with the ancient world. Yes. I mean, the greatest, for many people, the greatest ancient Greek building, the, the Parthenon, is shattered ruin of what it was. I mean, it's not even, it's like uh, taking a great portrait by uh, Holbein, removing all the clothes and most of the underwear and, you know, saying this is what, what I mean, the, the, the building, I mean, a, a Greek would be appalled, an ancient Greek would be appalled to think that we, you know, the Parthenon and at the sculpture, you know, all the bronzes are lost, we only have these ham-fisted uh, marble copies, you know, copies made in marble is very different material. It's, yeah, so we're, we're struggling to try and understand, as you say, what, what Leonardo's Mona Lisa, with all its subtlety and beauty, might have looked like if all we had was a mosaic copy of it done by a decorator in Pompeii. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In relation to our ancient art. Yes, well, we have some. I mean, I should choose an example in the book of a, a, a very great mosaic, which is in the. I mean, that's why I mentioned mosaic, great mosaics in the the uh, museum of the Capitol Mont. No, in the archaeological museum in Naples, from mm. the floor of the house of the Fawn in Pompeii. So it was really carpet on the floor. It was, you know, wall to wall carpeting in mosaic. But it's a copy, Pliny tells us, of a great painting by Philoxenus of Eretria. Uh, the Battle of Issus between Alexander and, uh, uh, and, and Darius. And it's full of the most, even the mosaic is full of these wonderful details of horses fleeing and seen in, in, a, seen in foreshortening as they flee from us, something that we, we don't see again in painting until 
high Renaissance uh, times. Yes. And yet here we are looking at it through a copy done by a floor maker in mosaic in Pompeii from Division. So, you know, this is what we're dealing with. And, and, and all I try to do in the Pythagoras book is, you know, take the few strands that I think we can we can hang on to and see what we can make of them. And, and how does this, I mean, perhaps it would be useful to, to talk a bit more about transmigration. Do you have a, I'm, I'm sure it would be very hard to state what, what you have gathered that uh, was believed by Pythagoras about transmigration. Uh, you mentioned that he did believe in it. And, and you have this rather nice image. I, I don't know whether this is your own, or it must be based on what, what you can glean historically, but this idea that the soul somehow each time it is instantiated, it, it, it knows what it needs to do and it learns more. So it's a kind of progression towards something beautiful and right that it is drawn towards through several instantiations. Not sure if I explained your feeling or your idea about it correctly there, but if not, you know. Yes, no, I, I think that is a very, no, I think you are saying it as, as I believe it. And of course, I'm, in a way, I'm sort of, you know, I'm not relaying what, what Pythagoras is saying. I mean, I'm building on that, obviously, and suggesting ways in which we can understand this. I mean, this is not Pythagoras' thinking. What we know about Pythagoras is that, as, as much as we know anything, that he was exposed to the idea and that he seems to have espoused it, hence the anecdote of the stop beating the dog because I recognize the voice of a deceased friend and it's yelping. What does this lead to? It leads to an understanding of universal kinship of, uh, of beings, of living things, that yes. we are related to all other things, and therefore we need to show respect and to, to, to understand that we're part of a hugely complex texture of repeating lives and existences. Okay, that's about as much as we can say that Pythagoras would have felt uh, uh, about yes. that. But then you compare it with your own experience, your own personal experience, and, and we know in lives that there are, you know, there are problems that we don't resolve in our lives, which come again and again and represent themselves. You know, we, we don't learn to be clear about something that we're a bit afraid of, and it comes back, you know, when we're in our 30s and our 40s and our 50s and our 60s, it comes back and it reminds us there are things which constantly, you know, we seem to be coming up against. There are things which, there are strange constellations of, uh, of situations in our lives which seem to come from somewhere, somewhere that's not just within our own experience in this life. And, you know, I mean, transmigration helps us to understand a little bit the mechanism of that. Of course. Not, I mean, Pythagoras, there's no evidence that Pythagoras, no. that. all we know is that he obviously picked up this idea from India and and ran with it. And um, yes, yes, I'm just interested because it's um it's always a difficult conception for Westerners, really. But um, and of course, what you've just remarked on these patterns that recur are, you know, core uh, tenets of every psychotherapist that we enact these same. Uh, things because we need to somehow understand them differently and come to terms with them, uh, which doesn't in, entail transmigration. But uh, as you know, uh, I'm just pointing out that one presumably needs to keep an open mind about it. I, I think one of the dangers is that people will narrow down. Oh, he was a he believed in transmigration. So he said you can't eat beans and so on. And and I think what you're doing all the time is unweaving that and and actually opening things up so that the ideas can be seen in a in a true more capacious um con oh, that, that, yes yes to be receptive to those ideas yeah you, you reminded me just actually earlier on you when we were uh, we were talking about sort of receptiveness i mean and, and the problem of language running against that i mean the oracles are a wonderful example of this because Mm. We think of ancient oracles as sort of quaint things in which people went and said, you know, should I marry, you know, her or, or, or her or whatever, and the oracle gives a sort of obscure reply and you go away and, and think about it. I mean, this is a construct, I believe, of oracles which comes from the post-verbal 
the verbal epoch, the post platonic time in which there has to be a mechanism, some explanation for what's going on. I think the earliest oracles, and I begin by saying this a little bit about the oracle of Zeus at Dodona, which is the oldest of all the, the oracles of the Greek world, that it involved putting yourself self into a receptive state of mind. People went all the way to a very remote place, Dodona, right in the sort of northwest of of Greek, high in the mountains, very difficult to get to, in order to listen to the sound of acorns dropping from an oak tree into bronze bowls. Mm. Okay, I mean, to everything of our age, it sounds like a complete hooey. It sounds like the most sort of ridiculous waste of time. Mm. But it's not that I think they posed questions and got answers. No, of course. Got answers to them. They put themselves into a receptive frame of mind, and this is what Pythagoras is, means by philosophia, being receptive, because wisdom is something we can't go and get and acquire and grab. It comes to us in the most extraordinary times when you're not looking. It comes to you, you realize it maybe even comes in sleep, it may come in dreams, it comes, it comes to you, and you have to be open and receptive to it, know it when it comes. And, uh, and not go out, you can't just sort of by some mental exercise go out and, and, and get these things. And the oracle was simply a vehicle for that, a way in which people could be together and be receptive together. And yes, yeah. and open the unconscious mind and the, yes. the, 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 the symbolic realm of imagination from the tyranny of the word, really. So I, I I, I like that. I, I would imagine that in every religion, the truly holy people talk about silence and receptivity rather than knowing. And would you go so far? I don't think you do go so far as to say that Pythagoras was actually um, teaching us that we have no certainties and that when one knows, one knows that one doesn't know. I can think of others who, who were doing that more than he. I mean, you know, one of his great contributions really was to say, hey, there actually are some certainties. And one of them is the, you know, the, the theorem, as it were, that nature does have some laws and that if vibrations on a string come into this particular pure arithmetical relationship, then there is a certainty that the sound, you know, so uh, I, I wouldn't say it's one of his primary. No. <laughs> there are others who are more, yes, more, more, yeah. more yeah. headed towards, and, and uncertainty is, of course, a very important, yeah. No, that, 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 uh, that, that uh, coincides with my understanding of what you, what you say about him, that he wasn't saying, you know, there are nothing, there's nothing we know. But there is this uh, other um, anecdote, isn't there, um, which relates to what you're saying, is that if you find uh, suddenly that a uh, rather important number like two uh, has a square root that's irrational, how do you respond to that? And one of the stories is probably from radio uh, Pythagoreanism, uh, that his some of his followers uh, certainly his followers try to hush this fact up and some of them couldn't bear it and drown themselves. Yes, well, there is the story that, it's a very confused story that even, uh, he, yes, one of the proponents of the, uh, of, of this, this knowledge was pushed overboard from a ship and drowned because it was uncomfortable knowledge for the Pythagorean school. Now, and this seems to me, uh, to me personally, in a moment of divorce between Pythagoreanism and Pythagoras my understanding for what it's worth of Pythagoras is that he wouldn't have felt that at all. He just thought, felt, I mean, to what, to the extent that he, he knew about and so we, we don't know the square root of two being an irrational number. He said, you know, this is really important. We need to take cognizance of this. What is the wider significance of this? That something, something we can see very clearly spatially with our eyes all you need to do is a, a square one unit by one unit by one unit, draw a line across the middle and that line across the middle is the square root of, uh, of two um you know it, we can see it as clear as you know but on the other hand we cannot define it mathematically 
We cannot say what it is. I mean, it's a fascinating thing. Irrational numbers are, I'm sure it would, I mean, he wouldn't have wanted to hash it up at all. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I'm, I like that. And I think that the, would you, would you be able to, I'm sure, you, I think you do really validate the idea that the anecdote about the dog, which after all is again, passed on by somebody, um, could just as well really be an anecdote about his compassionate attitude towards being, you know, part of the whole creation. That's, I think, what you are saying yeah. in an almost Buddhist-like way that all, all of creation is ultimately as one. And when one does this to another creature, one does it to oneself. One does it to oneself. And they, abs no, I would absolutely say that. And of course, <laughs> you're mentioning Buddhism reminds one, of course, they, as far as we know, can't be certain, they're contemporaries. Mm. Um, in other words, there's, there's a, it's a wonderful moment in the history of human, uh, the evolution of human thinking that Confucius and the person that we think of as Lao Tzu, though probably it wasn't a single individual, it was a group of sages, we, we don't know because Lao Tzu just means venerable man. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's say certainly Confucius, some of the, the Taoist fathers, uh, the Buddha in India, and uh, yes. Pythagoras and his contemporaries are all you know, uh, living and, and thinking and talking at the same time. Yes. All my point is, is that yes. Gautama, uh, Siddhartha Gautama is taking things from Vedic literature and doing what he wants with it. Pythagoras is tapping into the same source and therefore no surprise if there are lots of, uh, yeah. Of links and also with with Taoism, which you mentioned earlier on in relation to, uh, to Heraclitus and, and yeah. So what's lovely is that yes, there is unity, but there is also diversity, okay. which is the, and it's yeah. this ability to have beautifully different ways of taking these things, holding them, and making something of them. Yes, the differentiation, but the union of that that is is so lovely. And and your historical point, you know, is. Uh, an interesting one. Uh, it's been called the axial age, you know, this this moment at which across the world, certain yeah. things just started to happen. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, the, the axial age sort of tends to imply that it was a sort of a zeitgeist moment. But I think I, I tried to explain that there was also was a geopolitical basis yeah. to this. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, Cyrus the Great, I mean, who binds the whole of the Near East, the Middle East, and right up to the Indus River under one rather enlightened rule, you know, the vast extent of the Persian Empire, which meant that it was possible to, to move freely and for ideas to move and for music to move and for images to move and traders to move across a large area. Now, when you have lots of fractured warring states, it's very difficult. Things get blocked and stopped along the way in, in a purely practical way. So I think there's a geopolitical underpinning of this in the person of Cyrus the Great, who was spoken of very admiringly in the Bible and the book of Ezekiel, I think it is. Uh, Alexander profoundly admired him. Um, and I mean, a, a, a man who, who, who made it possible for this link between uh, different cultures to happen mm. and yeah I think I make just an incidental passing comparison with the time when Marco Polo traveled from Venice to to China um, it was because the Mongol Empire had basically dominated all that territory between the north of China and the Dalmatian coast under one empire, so that it was possible you know, to move freely without interruption across that time. Now, okay, Marco Polo wasn't actually a great philosopher, but he, <laughs> his journey was important, but for, 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 the, for the history of ideas, Cyrus's contribution to that axial or axial age, as you uh, refer to it, is important. So, I mean, I think it's grounded in, in geopolitics as well. And yes. Alexander again, when he, you know, reverses that situation, takes the Greek world right to the borders of the Indus, influencing the first, the very first visual representations of the Buddha, because in the, the 
um, 200 years between the time life of the Buddha and uh, the, the arrival of Alexander, the beginning of Buddhist art, actually later 500 years, um, Buddhist art forbade the portrayal of the, the Buddha. It, he was only symbolized by his footprint or whatever. And the first uh, images come from Greek Asian artists combined in the cities that Alexander seeded in Gandhara and the borders of what we would call Pakistan and Afghanistan today. I mean, it's an extraordinary story. And, and the Buddha appears as a Greek philosopher teaching wearing a toga. It's, it's a remarkable mm. moment. Mm. Fascinating. Because these influences run to and fro across, across this wide area. When there is a geopolitical situation which allows for wide movement, most of the time that's not the case so things the influences don't move that much because they're simply blocked by borders and wars and so forth yes perhaps it would be appropriate to at this point i think we'll we will we'll, we'll probably be drawing towards an end yes um but it, it, what i'd like to ask you coming down from this cosmic realm that you've been looking at to the very individual yourself, <laughs> um, you describe rather movingly an experience or experiences that you have had and that you imagine other people having. It's rather a lovely passage. I, I might just read it actually. Um, so you're talking about the experience of sacred beauty and you say, in our lives, there may occur moments when an aspect of divine cosmos appears to reveal itself to us through harmonia in what seems like completeness. We know immediately when this happens. For a moment which is passing, but has no measurable length in time, fears and anxieties fall away from us without a sound. And we're like a child who is pushed out into deep water and swims instinctively for the first time. Unsupported and out of depth into the expanse of a benign sea. What was unacknowledged fear up until moments before is now transformed into release and fulfillment. The water miraculously buoys us up and we are reassured and amazed to feel its support. The sensation at such moments is of an unmistakable push. Nature launches into her immensity, but does so with utter beneficence and in a way that leaves us changed. We are now the independent swimmer, no longer the fearful shoreline paddler of before. <laughs> <laughs> we're master of a new element. We're a greater human soul as a result. These are the moments in which we are alive and for which we live. Anyone who has not felt this unmistakable push of harmonia at some time or times in their life will find it more difficult to understand truly what Pythagoras is meaning. Mm. I think it's a, 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 a beautiful passage, but what it obviously says is that this is something not just a, a, an intellectual project, but has some Yes, meaning close to your heart as well. Yes, I'm mean, just trying to explain, yeah, because I think, I think many or most of the people who are listening to us, maybe so kindly, have had some experience, maybe once in their life or a hundred times, who knows, but there are these moments that surprise us. We never know when they're going to come. And yes, it, it, it was simply, I, I don't remember when Pythagoras came into my life. I don't really know, I can't, I mean, my memory is bad anyway, but I can't remember how the, what the genesis of this book was. But um, he certainly sort of, he got in there and he wouldn't go away until the book was finished. <laughs> and um, yes, in a way, it's an attempt to explain those moments, which I think are terribly important. Poets have them and refer to them and we recognize them in their poetry. And that's the joy of poetry because it's a way of our accessing those moments, you know, with reading the poetry of Wordsworth or of Blake, or not just romantic poets, you know, even moments in Homer as well. Um, could you possibly, you may not be able to, but could you give us an instance of something that you remember happening that, that was life changing in this way? No, because I don't think it needs to be, um, well, it, it is life-changing in a way. No, I mean, I, while I was writing the book, it happened on a walk with God one day, and just uh, the regular walk that I do every day. 
um, amongst the same trees, the same plants, the same views, the same road, the same bridges, the same, you know, but for a moment, which as I say, can't be really measured. It just suddenly became transformed with a sense of benignity and harmony. And um, I don't know, yes, that's... <laughs> Something very face. banal, but unexpected, but on the other hand, it enriches, and it's happened at other moments in life as well. I don't know what happens, some short circuit in the brain or whatever. Well, no, it's, a, it's a lovely story. Uh, I should point out to the uh, viewers that you live in a very beautiful place, a Greek island, and so this walk with a dog was no ordinary walk. <laughs> but in any case, the, the dog what spoke the other walk now. The dog spoke and the philosopher listened, so mm -hmm. <laughs> there we are. Mm -hmm. I just want to show people this book. Here it is. Can you, can you see that? Um, a very beautiful book. Um, and as I say, Matthew, it should be, but it's not long. It reads like a collection of essays, really, more than anything. It's a number of topics and uh, there isn't, any, it seems heavy, but that's because the illustrations needed a certain weight of paper and yeah. I can think of a certain 16th century Frenchman who wrote a colossal book. It was really just a collection of essays. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to, to, uh, so thank you very much, Nigel, yeah, for, for joining me and, and talking about this. And um, I hope that people will, will learn from it and want to know more. So there we are. Well, thank you very much. It's been very nice. And we okay. only covered a quarter of the material. There we are. <laughs> there we are. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.